because I'm a, a baby boomer, you know, these things don't tend to come naturally to us, technology-based assets in particular. But the reason I think Bitcoin resonated so much with me is because of the concept of mining. I come from Wyoming, which is a mining and oil and gas state. Uh, so conceptually that resonated with me. I also was looking when I was state treasurer of Wyoming for a great store of value. Because while we were trying to diversify our investments, we wanted some that produced income in the short term. And then we wanted others that really were focused on holding and growing their long-term value. And so Bitcoin resonated with me because it's such a hard asset. It really is digital gold. U.S. Senator Cynthia Lummis is one of the bipartisan senators that worked on a piece of landmark bill that could bring some much-needed regulatory clarity to the cryptocurrency industry. Amongst other stipulations, the proposed legislation could end the confusion over which crypto assets are commodities and which are securities. If passed, it would create a regulatory framework for all digital assets. Senator Lummis, who has earned the nickname Bitcoin Senator for her work on the bill, purchased her first Bitcoin in 2013 on her son-in-law's advice. She became the first U.S. senator to own the leading crypto asset and, as of 2021, owned about $230,000 worth of the crypto asset. In a recent interview, Lummis speaks about the crypto industry, especially Bitcoin, which she describes as a hard asset in digital gold. The senator also gives an update on the bill, how regulatory clarity will help Bitcoin and the hope Bitcoin brings to people with a continuous devaluation of fiat currencies. We will now take you to the senator's interview. Please watch, share, and like this video as we bring you this important update on the digital asset space. Also, ensure you drop your comments and observations below and check out our other crypto-related videos. Thanks and enjoy the video. Uh, it is something that will continue because of its scarcity. There will only be 21 million Bitcoin, never mind. It, its scarcity will continue uh, to allow it to hold its value. I come from the commodity industry, the ranching industry. We're invested in land. Uh, we're producing grass and grass is what we market. We market it through the cattle but we want to nurture and be good stewards of the land because we want it to continue to produce the grass, which produces the cattle, which produces our annual income. So taking good care of the land, being its steward is an important thing for all generations. And that resonated with me as well in terms of how Bitcoin, if we're good stewards, uh, can also be nurtured and continue to hold its value for the future. Well, I love that it can't be stopped, uh, especially because I'm concerned about our national debt. I'm concerned about inflation. Uh, I see people in my home state of Wyoming that are going to food banks now because uh, they need fuel, they need gasoline to get to their jobs and they have to choose now between high-priced gasoline and food, so they're going to food banks for their food. So when we see things that are inflationary, when we see the value of a dollar drop, when you go to the grocery store and you come out with one sack of food and you used to, for the same price, come out with two, uh, we really need to look at assets uh, that are gonna be there for the long term. Uh, and that's why, to me, it's actually comforting uh, to know that Bitcoin is there. And so I think as people learn more about it and become comfortable and familiar uh, with an asset that is online, they'll begin to see it as something that they can, that is a backstop, it's behind them, and they'll have it uh, for their long-term savings and long-term future. And I think it's even more important for people who are of modest means. We're seeing it in this country from people who are of modest means, but even more so overseas, where uh, some of the earliest uh, uh, adopters of this wonderful technology uh, are people who live in places where the government uh, is unstable. And they know that their very uh, homes uh, or property uh, is not secure 
because the government can actually come and take it. And Bitcoin is something the government cannot take. And for people in foreign countries that are living in places that are very insecure, this is definitely a backstop and something that they can comfortably go to bed at night and know it's going to be there in the morning. Earlier in the year, Senator Lummis and New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand unveiled the Responsible Financial Innovation Act, their bipartisan proposed legislation aimed at building a federal regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. If the bill passes, the United States could immediately overcome other countries to become the world leader in crypto innovation and inclusion. In her interview, Senator Lummis gives an update on the bill while also discussing some of the kinks she's working out with the Treasury Department and how the bill will impact the industry. Here's a clip from the interview. Well, this is a very comprehensive piece of legislation, probably too comprehensive given the time remaining in 2022 for the bill to pass. But what that does is give us more time uh, to get more input on the bill and uh, we, we want to embrace that. We want people to provide additional input and ideas and thoughts. Uh, so by all means, uh, you can find it on GitHub. You can go uh, look up elements of it that you uh, want to uh, weigh in on. And, and please do, we encourage people to give us feedback. Yes, there's an amount that is de minimis uh, in the bill, so as the Lightning Network and other opportunities mm -hmm. to use it, not just as a store of value, but as a means of exchange, uh, become more mainstream, uh, we want to have an amount that is just not subject to taxation and, and reporting and disclosure. Uh, and uh, I think we started the bill at either 600 or 1,000 and tried to take it up from there. Treasuries pushed it down to 50. Uh, and uh, to me, that's too de minimis. Maybe I was a little uh, ambitious on my side to uh, allow people more freedom with their money. But uh, we're, we are looking for not only what is the right de minimis amount that should be exempt from um, taxation and disclosure, but uh, why? Why is that the right amount? For example, here at Bitblock Boom, there was a gentleman from Australia who said in Australia, there's a $10,000 de minimis amount uh, that uh, gives them the freedom uh, to uh, be innovative within this space. So having that example that's already a real world example used in another country will help us. So I encourage people who are listening to you and your many, many listeners uh, to weigh in, help us. Bitcoin will actually benefit by having some of the bad actors regulated, disclosed and out of the scene because for some people, they don't understand the difference between Bitcoin and an altcoin. And an, there are a lot of altcoins that are just fraudulent. They are scams. So they should be under the control and jurisdiction of the SEC because the SEC really is good at disclosure and consumer protection. So as, uh, as soon as more of the bad actors can be dismissed, the better it looks for Bitcoin because of its complete decentralization uh, and, and the qualities that make it digital gold. So regulation is actually good for Bitcoin because among all the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is going to emerge as the gold standard. Near the stumbling blocks that the bill will no doubt meet in Congress is the issue of Bitcoin's environmental friendliness or lack of one. Recently, with Ether's switch to proof-of-stake mining and claims that it was going to be using more than 95% less energy, there have been a lot of speculations about the effect of Bitcoin's proof-of-work mining on the environment. In her interview, the Wyoming senator discusses the difference between Ether's proof-of-stake and Bitcoin's proof-of-work mining. Well, one of the interesting things that's happening is that while Ethereum has uh, uh, touted the advantages of being uh, a proof of stake, 
uh, as opposed to proof of work, and that means it's environmentally more friendly, and people begin to embrace it. Uh, I, I, I think that there's very little understanding uh, of how that can affect uh, its more centralized uh, approach. And one of the people who I think really understands that is Gary Gensler, who's the head of the SEC. And his voice on these issues is going to be important uh, within this administration. So um, I'm pretty confident that he's, the jury's still out with him on, uh, on Ethereum and where it should fall in terms of a regulatory um, bucket. And uh, we use this Howey test in our bill, uh, which is a well understood, well defined test to help sort between what is a commodity and what is a uh, security. And the characteristics of Ethereum uh, may change over time as it goes from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. And so I think one of the reasons that Gary Gensler has not weighed in, put his hand on the scale about Ethereum is that he's probably looking at how this is going to affect uh, its characteristics. Right. For many crypto community members, the jury is still out on the issue of regulatory clarity. Several popular investors, including Michael Saylor, Raul Powell, Kevin O'Leary, and Gareth Soloway, have stated that regulatory intervention could launch us into the next bull run. However, several other crypto investors believe regulation, like the proposed legislation, could change the dynamics of the industry. What do you think about getting some regulatory clarity for the industry? Would it help asset prices or turn crypto assets into glorified traditional assets? Please let us know what you think in the comments section below. Also, ensure you drop your comments and observations on Cynthia Lummis' interview, hit the like button, and subscribe to the channel for more crypto-related videos. Thanks for watching.